I'm rushing this shot. I got a little bit late here. And welcome back. I'm in a trail called the Donkey Trail, or La Esquina del Asino, here on Mount Etna. And uh, the reason why I'm here is that I wanted to try the, as you probably guessed from the title, the new Tamron 11 to 20 millimeters f2.8 for Fujifilm. Uh, as usual, this video, this video is sponsored by myself because I purchased the lens that you see over here on my uh, Fuji X-H2. I shot a couple of shots. I didn't uh, shoot that much uh, B-roll footage because I got here just in time, just, just, just in time. Um, and here are a couple of these shots. So, I hope you like the shots. Um, talking about the lens, uh, the lens is roughly the same size and a little bit less weight than the 10 to 24 millimeters from Fuji. And uh, subscribe and leave me a like because I'm going to push a di direct comparison because I have that lens, it's the one that I'm filming me right now. Um, and so, it is in direct competition with that, with that lens. It is actually the only f2.8 uh, super wide uh, lens from Fujifilm that is not the 8 to 16, which, as you probably know, has a curved front element. It's a huge lens, and in order to use filters, you need to spend a lot of money with external accessories and all of that that allows you to use filters on that. This one is a normal uh, zoom with a 67 millimeters filter thread which is basically the same on the 17 to 70. So uh, Tamron tried to help you with uh, keeping the same filter size. And the lens, despite being an f2.8, is very lightweight. The construction is solid, is very similar to that of the 17 to 70. It's uh, high quality plastics, uh, but everything feels uh, very solid, very good. Nothing to com complain about it. There's no... Um, Aperture ring, uh, as usual with Tamron lenses, and you have a small um, manual focusing ring on the front. Uh, the one thing that may be a problem for some is that the lens has a kind of a limited zooming range because going from 11 to 20 is basically a 17 to 30 millimeters equivalent. Not your usual 16 to 35, like the 10 to 24 again. Um, it all depends on you because uh, while I do understand and the one millimeter makes some difference, on the telephoto end, where the most of the differences are, you are somehow covered by your normal zoom range. Now, I would not uh, overlook the fact that those four millimeters that are missing on the on the telephoto end. Uh, of this lens have a little bit of an impact more than the missing one millimeters on the wide end. Uh, just because uh, for convenience purposes, sometimes you don't want to swap lenses that, that often. And having that little bit of additional reach sometimes lets you shoot the picture uh, with your wide, end, wide lens uh, instead of swapping to your normal lens and then using that one. So again, uh, not a big deal, not a dramatic deal, but something that is worth being mentioned. I'm loving this place. I love this place. I've been hiking uh, this place several times. By the way, if you know, want to know more about the hike, this is a 40-45 minutes hike with a decent uh, pace. And the, there's no difficulties aside from the fact that it starts steep at the beginning and then it makes, it makes your life easier towards the end. So you just need to be prepared that the the vast majority of the ascent comes at the beginning of your of your hike.
forgot to mention that from this place you can see the craters over there but on the other side you see uh, the sea and then mainland Italy uh, that's Calabria it's the, the, the region that is facing Sicily so uh, this place is just is beautiful and early in the morning it's so quiet it's and peaceful I can stay here for hours So if you haven't guessed it already, this is the mystery lens that I was using while reviewing the Tamron 150-500. to I was working with this lens and actually I'm now on the Tamron 11-20 to because uh, right now I'm using it for vlogging. And one thing that I forgot to mention before is that this lens is not stabilized uh, while, for example, the 10-24 to it is. Now, um, is... Is this a big problem? I mean, is it something that uh, you should be worried about? I would say yes, only if you plan on shooting a lot handheld with non-stabilized cameras. Uh, other than that, I believe that considering that now all the cameras are coming out with stabilizing stabilizer with OIS uh, with uh, IBIS, call it whatever you want, uh, this is becoming less of an issue uh, because again you get the stabilization on the on the camera and not only that you also get um, increasingly better stabilization on camera uh, something that together with the uh, fast readout speed that you get on the newest camera such as the xh2s or the xs20 uh, solves also the issue of the wobbling corners that uh, we used to have with super wide lenses uh, in the past. So um, you're seeing the footage right now. I'm using uh, uh, IBIS and digital stabilization, but I'm not using, uh, not stabilizing this footage in post uh, because I want you to see what you get when you use this lens. Um, to me, it's not a big deal. Again, uh, I used it inhaled even with a uh, very low shutter speed and I didn't have any particular issue. Of course, a lens like the 10 4 gives you a little bit of an edge when it comes to, to stabilization, especially for, for pictures, but it's not something I would um, base my purchase decision on. That's probably the best way of putting it. One last thing, um, I don't know if you have noticed that uh, my, my backpack is different from uh, before and I actually bought an action, a Shimoda Action X50. It's the first model, I bought it right before the new model got launched and uh, I know it's the previous model but at the end of the day the differences are so uh, minor that uh, if you're interested, I'm willing to push out the review anyway. So let me know in the comments below if it's something you may be interested in. Now vlogging at f2.8 and you can tell you can clearly say tell that the depth of field is uh, definitely reduced and it gives you that I don't know kind of pop 
where I stand out of the frame. And this is good because, of course, being an APS-C sensor, uh, you need uh, to open your aperture quite a bit, especially at the wide end, to get three-dimensional, a three-dimensional look. But I must say, uh, this lens does really good with that. And this may be one of the advantages of these lenses, of this lens, but we, uh, we will talk about it later in the studio. Oh, a pine cone almost hit me. And here we are. I just got to my car that is over there, the white one. And before wrapping this video up, this section of the video up, uh, let me know in the comments if you're interested in my new microphone you see over here. The Holland Lark M1. It's a very compact and inexpensive wireless setup with two transmitter and wire receiver because I just bought it and I'm using it net these days trying to see if it's worth it. So if you're if you're interested, let me know in the comments below. I'm done for here and I'll see you in the studio in a second for you in quite a bit for me. Bye. And here we are back in the studio. And without any further ado, let's go check the image quality on this uh, brand new 11 to 20 millimeters from Tamron. As usual, my sharpness tests are performed with the 40 megapixel sensor on the X-H2 because I want to stress the most out of these lenses. And speaking of sharpness, uh, usually for a wide angle lens, the weakest spot is a wide angle and wide, wide open. In this specific case, at 11 millimeters f2.8, the lens performs already really, really, really good because the center sharpness is already great and the corners are just a little bit behind, but not that much. They're very sharp, even wide open. And the only thing you can see is some uh, big, big netting, which is to be expected at the widest at the widest setting. But other than that, the image is really, really good. And if you stop down to a 4, a 5, 5.6, f8, you, you, sure, you have a little bit of improvement on the, on, the, on the corners, but it's nothing dramatic. It's nothing that would uh, force you to choose one aperture over the other because of the sharpness that, that, that you get. If you want to shoot at f2.8 with this lens wide at the wide focal range, you can do it without thinking about it. Um, Vignetting goes away around f5.6, between f5.6 and f8, and something to be considered if you want to have the perfect shot, you're going to have some vignetting. But other than that, you don't see any issue with this lens. There's a little bit of barrel distortion at the widest setting, uh, which is a bit visible, but not too much. Of course, this is... Uh, this lens is corrected via software uh, with the embedded pro profile. So what you see is the remaining that is not corrected. Uh, but nothing to worry about too much. Honestly, probably if you're doing architecture, maybe you may you may notice it. But for landscape or stuff like, like that, you really won't notice any of that. The diffraction starts hitting after f11. Uh, where you get a degradation of the image, of course, at f16, which is also the closest you can get uh, with your aperture. So you don't get the option to go f22 because uh, this lens starting at f2.8, it, it's not shocking that it doesn't get that close. So your range is f2.8 to f16, and at f16, you definitely see some uh, diffraction effect creeping in and ruining your, your image. So if you want to stay safe, shooting the range between f2.8 and f11 and you're gonna get the most out of this lens basically the story is the same throughout the zooming range it's really 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 good at f2.8 from center to corners and corners get only a little bit better uh, as you stop down they never get the same exact quality of the center which is not shocking especially for super wide lenses that are corrected via software you you can expect that corners are not exactly as sharp as the center but there's they're really really sharp and they're really sharp starting in f2.8 so throughout the zooming range you can you can pretty much assume that you can shoot whatever you want at whatever aperture setting that you want at whatever focal range that you want and that's pretty refreshing because usually uh, zooms 
have weakest spot stuff mo moments where you have to think about eh, that's probably that's not the best setting for this lens to get the most out of it with this one you don't have to worry about it probably this impressive performance is due to the fact that the focal range is not that dramatically extended it's not even a, a two time zoom because it comes it starts at 11 and it ends at 20 which has its shortcoming when it comes to um convenience but for image quality it's a, it's an impressive performance sharpness aside uh, sun stars produced by this lens are decent but they're not they're not great and uh, you can see that uh, they're not very well defined and so it's not the best lens for that but you can live with it i mean unless this is what you do for your uh for living and you only sh want to have sun stars then it's not a big deal it would have been it would have helped if they were better but they're basically not uh, chromatic aberrations are very well con controlled uh, I'd, I'd say I, you can barely notice them you have to look for them uh, pretty de pretty deeply and probably the only moment where you can see some chromatic aberrations when you're shooting uh, very close to your subject like a macro although this is not a macro lens you can get pretty close but as typical for most of the zooms when you get close to the minimum focusing distance what you get is a little bit softer image and some chromatic aberration. Other than that, the lens is really, really good. Bokeh, when focusing really close, is decent. Actually, it's good. And it's refreshing to have the possibility to uh, generate some separation from subject and background with a super wide zoom lens on an APS-C sensor. This is thanks to the fact that the lens being f2.8 uh, we have that kind of poss possibility so in general when it comes to image quality you can trust this lens it's a solid optical performer it's not gonna let you down and it's gonna get you uh pretty much the shots that you want without create without getting in the way and, and this is a lot when it comes to especially when it comes to third-party lenses uh, at prices that are not uh, super high it's something that it's not that easy to find When it comes to autofocus, of course, with wide-angle lenses, super wide-angle lenses, the best autofocus in the world is not as dramatic as on a 500 millimeter lens because it's harder to miss the shot. There's a lot more uh, wiggle room. The, the depth of field on a wide angle is a lot longer. So you, you don't have the same type of, uh, you don't need the same type of precision and quickness because it's just easier to focus on a wide wide angle lens however this lens is really good i can i did not have any issue focusing with this lens uh which is a lot and again i didn't miss any shot and even uh with my tests in low light and all of that the lens performed really good and really i can call the lens reliable and being reliable is the best thing you can say about another focus on any uh photographic lens so uh, really good uh, speed is fine to me the autofocus is uh, more than good and I didn't have any issue with it speaking of video the biggest notable thing when when uh, talking about video is the fact that this this lens these Tamron uh, 11 to 20 uh, lacks an image stabilization now as i mentioned already in on, in the field uh, this may or may not be a big issue depending on what camera you're using on or what it is that you're shooting your style of shooting because of course if you're shooting on a tripod who cares if you're uh if you have a very good stabilized camera i'm not saying who cares but it's not as dramatic of course if you're shooting on an xt3 and you want to shoot handheld well then you need to rely on a on a gimbal or something that helps you stabilizing the lens or you are very good at ninja walking which i'm not at all in any case uh with for my use case scenario i have an xh2s for video and an xh2 for photos 
DXH2S stabilization is really good in video. It's probably not the best in the market, but it's really good. And I didn't find any issue uh, with uh, using this lens handheld. You saw the footage at the beginning of the video. I did not stabilize in post. It was just IBIS and digital image stabilization, which I always use. I know it crops in a little bit, but it makes the footage so much better and I don't have to work on it afterwards, pretty much never. So that's my setup. And with that setup, I could not complain about the lens. And on the X-H2S, thanks to its um, stack sensor, you don't even have that wobbly corners that you tend to have with super wide angle lenses and and a little bit slower uh, readout speed on other cameras. I also believe that that is a combination of stabilization in the lens and stabilization on the camera that sometimes goes crazy. And so in this case with the Tamron, everything is made easier because it's just a stabilization on the camera. Now, I'm not telling you that it's better to have a non-stabilized lens. I'm only telling you that in this specific case, the combination XH2S and 11 to 20 works really good. And at the end of the day, that's that's what that's what matters. Even when it comes to autofocus for video, results were really consistent. I didn't have any issue while I was vlogging, despite the light getting uh, in the frame from whatever corner, uh, despite anything, I didn't have any issue with losing uh, the subject. So the tracking works really good. Uh, focus transition are not bad, although speaking of focus transitions with a super wide angle lens doesn't make that much sense because there's there's not much to, tra to transition from one to from one spot to another but again those that i saw uh didn't bother me at all the one thing that i noticed uh, that requires that needs to be mentioned it's not a problem it's more of a something that you need to be aware of and it's the fact that the moment you start recording your video, then the lens, the camera applies the correction. So you see the image going from one visualization to the corrected one. And that worries you at the beginning, the first time you do it, because I didn't notice that with other lenses. Uh, but other than that, I didn't see any particular issue while shooting. So it's something that triggers your... Uh, your anxiety just because you're not used to it but it's not a big deal that's the only thing that i would that i would say that is negative about the video per performance with this lens in conclusion as you probably uh, can tell i'm very impressed with this lens there's one thing that i didn't mention is that um it's different from other lenses. It's more compact when it's set at 20 millimeters and it'll slightly extend, but really slightly extends uh, when it's set at 11 millimeters. So when you're putting the camera in your backpack, you, chances are you're, you're, storing the, you're storing the lens at 20 millimeters. So you have to think about that. In order to go wider, you have to ro rotate the zoom while usually the most com uh, compact form is at the when it's set at the wide wide angle wide angle uh, setting. Not a big deal, but it's something that it's worth being being mentioned. So as I was saying, to some extent, I'm also surprised by the quality of this lens because I mentioned already that I've always been a big fan of Tamron lenses, and I have always found Tamron lenses to be really good. But in this specific case, I also consider this lens to be even better than I expected. And I know it may sound like I'm some kind of uh, Tamron fanboy because I've been reviewing Tamron lenses for the last months. I've reviewed all the four Tamron lenses that we have for the Fujifilm si system. I have reviewed them and the only one that I didn't like, I still think it was a, a lemon that I got, uh, but I, ne I never had the chance to test it. Uh, again and i'm referring to the 11 to the 18 to 300 but all the others i was really impressed with the lens this one is even better the only downside is that it's not an extended zooming range so it's kind of limiting it's uh it's not your typical 10 to 24 
uh, so in st your typical uh, 15, 16 to 35, uh, which may or may not be a problem depending on the way you, you use it. But the lens is uh, very well built, super compact, super lightweight despite being f2.8. Uh, it's accurate and fast while focusing, uh, and it's got a great image quality that I did not expect. And Honestly, it's got no comparison in the Fujifilm lineup just because Fujifilm hasn't uh, committed to come up with a lens like this. Because we have the 10 to 24, but it's f4, and we have the 8 to 16, which it is f2.8, but it's huge compared to this, and it's also got the, that front element that doesn't allow to use a screwing filter or normal filters. You need to buy something external, and you need to buy much bigger uh, filter if you want to use uh, those on that on that lens which makes your life more complicated this one is a very usable convenient lens uh, at the right price because msrp is 899 but i'm pretty sure this is gonna go around 700 750 pretty soon and for that price is it's a real it's a it's a really good lens. It's a, it's a, I'm not saying a steal because you're paying a good amount of money, but it's a really good lens. So to me, this is a lens that we uh, were missing in the Fujifilm panorama because uh, it was weird not to have something like that. And especially because a lens like this is used a lot in a lot of areas, architectural photography, uh, ceremony photography, events, weddings, whatever, like, there's a lot of use case scenario for this lens and so it's a huge addition to the potential of a Fujifilm shooter. To me, it's a huge thumbs up. Now, let me know in the comments below what you think about it. If you think that, uh, if I missed something in the review, if I want to know something more about the lens, uh, consider also that the next video is going to be a direct comparison between this lens and the 10 to 24 because uh, they overlap to some extent although they are not comparable 100%. And um, I guess that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave me a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.